ancient biblical prophets wrote about the future. Today, theologians are poring over those scriptures with a firm belief that their prophecies are coming to pass. Journey now into the world of eschatology on Prophecy in the News with author and lecturer J.R. Church. What I'm about to tell you is not motivated by a political agenda. I approach this subject as a theologian. And this is not the final word on the subject. I would uh, encourage you to keep this in mind as you hear what I have to say. Only discuss this subject for your consideration. I'm not trying to be dogmatic with what I'm going to be telling you today. I simply want you to consider what you hear and see and then forget it. <laughs> Lest you tickle the tail of the dragon. The first place we go is Rome. What you see before you is the Circus Maximus from ancient Rome, the place of the chariot races. This long expanse area here is where Nero once gathered to enjoy his evening chariot races. He, he loved horse racing. Now, according to Ludwig's handbook of New Testament rulers and cities, Ludwig says the shadows were lengthening across the warm hills of Rome as busy slaves erected final crosses in Nero's magnificent gardens. While they worked, soldiers brought in Christians and either tied them or nailed them to crosses. Next, they soaked them with inflammable pitch. Now, darkness had frequently put a stop to the emperor's chariot racing, but this evening would be different. The burning of Christians would provide the light. Soon the chariots were lined up, the crosses were lit, the horses leaped forward, but there was no real enthusiasm in the cheers of the citizens of Rome that night. Such flagrant cruelty was too much even for them. Now Nero got the message. He, he realized that he was a little strong burning those Christians. And so, seeing he'd displeased the crowd, Nero never repeated this performance. Instead, he, he contented himself by throwing Christians to the lions inside the Colosseum that you see before you. Um, he dressed them in animal skins and turned dogs on them and, by, and he killed those who were Roman citizens with the sword, so says Ludwig in his book. This is the inside of what was once the massive Colosseum, where on this floor where you see dressing rooms below, on this top level here, they fed Christians to the lions. Well, the crowds cheered, give me more blood. Let's see more mayhem. This was a civilized society you can imagine such a thing. Today, Nero is remembered for his cruelties, and especially for having beheaded the Apostle Paul. Strangely enough, in the beginning of his reign, he was immensely popular because he was generous, kind, and understanding. On October 13, AD 54, the same year Paul wrote the first book of the New Testament, the first book of the 27 books of the New Testament was written the year Nero rose to power, 1 Thessalonians. Matthew and the other books came after that. Nero's mother, Agrippina, poisoned Caesar Claudius. She made certain that his death, death was kept secret until all the arrangements had been finalized to place her ambitious son on the throne. 
Nero, of course, was ecstatic at his elevation, even though he knew the truth. After divine honors had been uh, voted for his stepfather, he remarked, quote, mushrooms must be the food of the gods, since by eating them, Claudius has become divine. And being an atheist, he thought that was funny. Vitellius arranged the marriage between uh, Agrippina and Claudius. Vitalius, according to Charles Ludwig, was formerly a senator who had, quote, arranged with the Senate to legalize the marriage between his or Nero's mother and Claudius. And he was the former governor of Syria. Vitalius was the former governor of Syria. Now, why would a man from the Seleucid dynasty, descendant of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, want to set Nero on the throne of Rome? unless, of course, there was something in it for him. Maybe, maybe Agrippina was kin to him, or maybe Nero was his son. I cannot tell you that he was. But for some reason, I, I just get the feeling that Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the man who sacrificed the pig on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem in 168 B.C., is in the family tree of this man. Nevertheless, in Nero's first speech, the Senate was aroused with great enthusiasm. Tacitus, the first century Roman historian wrote, he set forth the principles and models by following which he hoped to administer the affairs of the empire in the best manner. In his house, he said, there should be no bribery nor corruption nor anything of the wilds of ambition and his family concerns should be kept distinct from the affairs of state. Well, the senator so loved his little speech that they engraved it in silver and decided that it should be read every year. Now, here's Nero's family lineage. Blue-eyed, freckle-faced Nero had reddish bronze hair and slightly heavy cheeks. He was said to be the son of Gnaeus Domitius, a uh, member of the Ahinobarbi uh, family. For 500 years, this family, noted for its red beards and blue blood, recklessly, recklessness and courage, had been at the top of Roman society. Nero's paternal grandfather was extravagant and had a passion for gladiatorial shows. Likewise, he was cruel to his slaves. Indeed, he was so cruel that he was denounced by Augustus Caesar. Here's Nero's original name, Lucius Domitius and Ahinobarbus. Now, Nero's father was said to be a profligate, noted for, his, uh, for incest, brutality, and adultery. He married Nero's mother when she was a mere 13. Dio quotes him as having said, no good man can possibly come from us. At his birth in AD 37 in Anzio, Nero was named Lucius Domitius and Ahinobarbus. He retained this name until his mother married Claudius. When he was adopted by his stepfather, the Caesar of Rome, his name was changed to Nero, Claudius, Drusus, Germanicus. Now I want you to notice that Caesar Nero's name adds up to 666 in Hebrew, and you can find this in the Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible in the five-volume set. This, his name was pronounced as Kaiser Neron. And you can see in Hebrew, Kaiser is spelled with a kof, a samik, a resh, for a total of 200. Uh, excuse me, a resh having 200 for a total of 360. And then Neron is spelled with a nun, a resh, a vav, a nun, uh, for a total of 306. 360 plus 306 is 666. So you can imagine why the people in Thessalonica in the year 54 thought that the Antichrist had arrived and they had entered the tribulation period, which prompted Paul's letter to say to them, this is not the final man. Not to worry, because you see, there must come first a departing and then the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Now I realize this word departing has also been translated apostasy, but they're both good translations. You'll just have to take your pick which one you believe. 
I want you to notice some of the things Nero did. He was, he was a man who liked to get rid of those who found out who he was and what his purposes were. Nero, for example, murdered Britannicus, his stepbrother, the son of Claudius. Uh, he posed a threat to Nero, and uh, Nero was afraid that he might try to take over his throne, so he wanted to get rid of him. He prepared a poison, held a banquet. Among those who attended the banquet were Britannicus, his intended victim, and Titus. You remember Titus was the man who destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. Well, in the midst of the festivities on that warm, sticky night, a waiter brought Britannicus a cup of hot wine. After diluting it with cold water, Britannicus took the fatal sup. As the servants carried the unconscious lad out of the banquet hall, Nero assured the guests that he had merely had an epileptic seizure. But by the following morning, the body had been cremated. Got rid of his evidence. And Nero's fame continued to soar. And then he decided he had to murder his own mother. He, he became convinced that his mother was against him and that the rumors he had heard were true. He decided that the only way was to kill her, that she should die by accident. He arranged for her to go home on a ship that was due to capsize. And as the boat sank, Agrippina swam to shore, to safety. Now, since it was night, those who were on it, or in on the um, murder plot, did not notice her escape. Nero then selected three officers to do the job. When a startled Agrippina viewed their sword, she jerked her skirt open and screamed, strike at the wound that bore Nero. So they did. I want you to notice some, uh, some more of Nero's unbridled wickedness. He, he poisoned the ant who had raised him, tore up her will and seized her estate. And then he banished Octavia, the sister of Britannicus, whom he had married at age 16, when he was 16. He banished Octavia, the daughter of Claudius. Twelve days later, he married his mistress, Papia. And afterward, he ordered Octavia to commit suicide, which she obliged. Now, upon returning home from the races one evening, Papia chided him mildly for being late. Enraged by her remark, he booted her in the stomach. And since she was pregnant, she died. Broken hearted, Nero ordered a state funeral and built a temple in her honor. But it didn't take him long to get over his sorrow over the death of the beloved Papia. For you see, he found a young man who looked kind of like her. Having found a youth by the name of Sporus who closely resembled Papia, he had him castrated, married him by a formal ceremony, and, quote, used him in every way like a woman, whereupon a wit expressed the wish that Nero's father had had such a wife. Nice guy. Of course, July 19, AD 64, a fire broke out in Rome. The blaze started in some of the wooden sheds just east of the Circus Maximus. And soon it spread to the foot of the Palatine and the Cilean Hills, uh, where vast quantities of oil and other inflammables had been stored. In those days, the streets of Rome were very narrow, and the flames leaped from one home to the next, and the fire raged for six days as one building after another fell. Then the thieves got busy looting and murdering and destroying property. When it seemed the conflagration had burned itself out, it started again and burned for another three days. Of course, by the time the fire was out, more than two-thirds of Rome was in ashes. Nero was terribly shaken. Poor guy especially because the libraries and museums had been destroyed. And so he worked hard to take care of the refugees. He felt their pain. <laughs> he erected a city of tents for them in the field of Mars and brought in the supplies of food for which he paid out of his own pocket. And then one sultry night he was seen on the tower of a garden theater across the Tiber where he had established his headquarters. There was a lyre in his hand, a little harp type instrument. And while the crowd watched horrified in silence, he began to sing about the sack of Troy and while he accompanied himself on the lyre. Soon word spread that Nero had set the fire. Such accusations were even scrawled on public buildings. Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Well, Nero became desperate for a scapegoat. 
to blame. Soon he found one. He blamed it on the Christians. The Christians burned Rome. In the words of Tacitus, first century Roman historian, he directed his fury against, quote, a race of men detested for their evil practices and commonly called Christina, or Christians. The name was derived from Christus, or Christ, who in the reign of Tiberius suffered under Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea. By that event, the sect of which uh, he was founder revived a, or received a blow, which for a time checked the growth of this dangerous superstition. But it revived soon after and spread with uh, rec uh, recruited vigor. Um, not only in Judea, but even, even the Christians proliferated in the city of Rome, this common sink into which everything infamous and abominable flows like a torrent for all, from all quarters of the world. Tacitus had a flair for writing, didn't he? With infinite cunning, Nero incited the Romans against the Christians. Tacitus wrote, quote, they were put to death with exquisite cruelty, and to their sufferings, Nero added mockery and derision. At length, the brutality of these measures filled every breast with pity. Humanity relented in favor of the Christians. This is a night scene at the place where the blood of the martyrs flowed in Rome. This road is the Appian Way. It comes through Constantine's arch and down the road through the arch of Titus to downtown ancient Rome called the Forum. In the distance, the Mamertine prison where the Apostle Paul spent the last months, last years of his life. Now from this point, Nero's popularity plunged. The army revolted in Spain and Galba was declared the new emperor. The Senate now decreed that Nero was an outlaw. He fled from Rome in disguise. Cornered on a June evening, on June the 9th, by the way, it's kind of interesting that a minister stood on Trinity Broadcasting Network, uh, few years ago and said God had revealed to him that God was going to rip evil from the earth on June the 9th, but he didn't tell him what year. So on one June the 9th evening, the anniversary of the death of Papia, he crept into a basement and there, shivering on a dirty cot, he tried to commit suicide. But the knife did not penetrate his throat deep enough. And so he begged his servant, Epaphroditus, to press the blade home. This is the forum. This is all that's left of ancient Rome. And uh, the Appian Way, mentioned in the book of Acts. And this was once a platform beneath a magnificent colonnaded building where Brutus stuck the knife under the fifth rib, you remember, of Caesar who turned and looked at Brutus and said, et tu, Brute? This is the place that, where that happened. But right across the street over here is the Mamertine prison where the Apostle Paul spent the last months of his life wrote many of our New Testament books from that place. As we look at the grisly reign of Nero, we cannot help but remember that in the days of his greatest popularity, Paul shivered in this Mamertine prison. This is the cell where Paul wrote many of our New Testament books. Paul shivered in the Mamertine prison near the Forum. From this prison, it is quite possible that he could hear the cheers of the senators as they clapped and shouted their approval of Nero. But things have a way of reversing themselves, don't they? In time, the words of this curly-haired emperor are either forgotten or despised, while the epistles of Paul, many written in this very prison, are loved and quoted everywhere. And today, 
We name our children Paul. We name our dogs Nero. <laughs> now it is said that as he, as he lay dying, he murmured, what a great artist dies with me. Oh, pity. He was 31 and had ruled for 14 years. He died on June 9th, anniversary of Octavia's suicide. Pardon me, it was not Papia's, but Octavia's suicide. Near the end of the first century, however, the Roman historian Tacitus, whom we quoted earlier, wrote about a rumor in AD 69 that Nero was still alive, that he had only faked his death. He said, quote, about this time, Achaia and Asia were upset by a false alarm. It was rumored that Nero was on his way to them, the Roman army. There had been conflict, conflicting stories about his death, and so numbers of people imagined and believed that he, he was a lie. In a book entitled The Coming Antichrist by Walter K. Price, Dr. Price writes, the most famous antichrist theory of the first century was that of Nero Redivivus. The belief that Nero would return was still in existence in the fifth century AD. Can you imagine 400 years later, this rumor of Nero being alive still persisted. Augustine, Saint Augustine wrote, quote, others again suppose that he, Nero, is not even dead, but that he was concealed that he might be supposed to have been killed and that now lives in concealment in the vigor of that same age which he had reached when he was believed to have perished and will live until he is revealed in his own time and restored to his kingdom. It was commonly believed as late as the fifth century that Nero someday would return to become the Antichrist. John makes a reference, I think, to Nero in Revelations 13, 18, where he says, Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. Perhaps he was referring to that Hebrew gematria of Nero's name. You see, he later wrote in chapter 17 of Revelation, the beast that thou sawest and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven. That is, one of those seven was his great, 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 grandfather, and goeth into perdition, the Antichrist. Now, Domitian was the Roman emperor who was living at the time John wrote this because he had been exiled to the island of Patmos by this cruel Roman emperor. In fact, Domitian was called the second Nero in history. Domitian, last of the Flavian line, was second only to Nero in his persecution of Christians. His victims were legion, including many members of his own family. One of his most ambitious goals was the complete obliteration of all the descendants of King David's lineage. He was a vain and lazy man who selfishly sought to empower himself. Genealogically, he was the son of Vespasian and brother to Titus. Yes, the man who destroyed the temple. Who had offered, by the way, to share power with him, but he refused. And when Titus lay ill, Domitian caused the royal physicians to take actions that would speed the death of Titus, his brother. Nice guy. Here's seven kings, five are fallen. Would those seven kings be Roman emperors? There were more than five. So who could we choose? Who, who were in mind as John wrote this passage in chapter 17 of Revelation? 
Our feeling is that he was referring to those who had something to do with Jewish exile and Jewish persecution. And so we began our, our suggestion of the seven with Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, and Darius, the arms of silver, and Alexander the Great, the belly of brass, and Antiochus Epiphanes, who took over part of Alexander the Great's kingdom. And from Antiochus for Epiphanes, I think, came Nero, though I cannot prove it, only suggests the possibility. But a lot of the Seleucid dynasty from Antiochus for Epiphanes of 168 BC went to Rome and intermarried with many of the Romans, including the Herodian line and uh, possibly uh, other Roman Caesars. They were ambitious people. So where did Antiochus for Epiphanes come from? Well, I think he was a Greek, and I believe the Greek came from the, at least the ruling elite of the nation of Greece came from the Spartans, and the Spartans had a king named Danius, if you'll read uh, Homer's Iliad. Danius came from Phoenicia, that's where the tribe of Dan used to live. And Danius had 50 daughters uh, that he called the Danaids, and they invented the cult of the mother goddess called Diana of the Ephesians. But you know the Trojans? They were Spartans who defected and one of them by the name of Dardanus went up to the isthmus of the Black Sea, the little body of water that separates the Black Sea from the Aegean Sea, and built an empire there called the Trojan Empire in the city of Troy. In fact, that isthmus is named after him. It's called the Dardanel. And there are four rivers that run into the Black Sea named for this Trojan and his empire. The Danube, the Danister, the Daniper, and the Don. When the Spartans sacked Troy and burned the city, Aeneas, Trojan prince, escaped and went to central Italy where he was the progenitor of Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. So you see there is that possible Danite connection, that tribe that disappeared when, in 1050 B.C., who is not even named in the first eight chapters of First Chronicles that gives the genealogies of all the tribes Dan is missing even then. You don't have to wait until you get to Revelation chapter 7 for Dan to be missing. So that was Nero, following Nero Domitian. Now we've chosen Hitler because he is the one whose reign maybe was just a short time, you know. Uh, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short space. Adolf Hitler continued only a short space, but he managed to destroy a third of Jewish world Jewish population. So who is the eighth king that goes into perdition? The seven men provide us a composite picture of the final Antichrist. He will command wealth and power. He will no doubt be quite charismatic and persuasive and gifted with high intelligence and drive. He will have a a sense of historical destiny. He will see the Jews as a, a barrier to the establishment of his kingdom. He'll be inhibited by an evil, or inhabited by an evil spirit, and uh, as was each and every man on this list. Well, we must hurry. Time is so precious. There was a movie that came out some years ago called The Omen. I'm not an advocate of movies, but this one was about the Antichrist, the child Antichrist. Had some interesting things in it, including the poem that pervaded this theme of the movie. The poem goes, when the Jews return to Zion and a comet fills the sky, the Holy Roman Empire revives and you and I must die. He rises from the eternal sea, creating armies on either shore pitting brother against brother till man exists no more. In the story, this child, Damien Thorne, is actually born of a jackal, born of demon seed. Mr. Misery's Thorne, Ambassador Thorne, Ambassador to Rome, does not realize that their baby was killed and their, they, the child was switched with a child born of demon seed. As the child Antichrist is placed in a rich and powerful foster home so that he might grow up to rule the world. 
As others find out about who he really is, Damien creates accidents in order to eliminate them. Here, a glass plate decapitates a man. And uh, here, Damien's uh, stepfather, Mr. Ambassador Thorne, sees his friend decapitated and is horrified, but he refuses to believe that his son could have anything to do with this bizarre tragedy, and dozens of accidents continue. Here, a woman is made by the will of Damien's mind to commit suicide, and here a man, another man is killed. In the second sequel to the movie, an archaeologist in Israel discovers a mural on a, on a wall a thousand years old in a crusader cave north of Acho, or north of Haifa at Acho. And when he sees it, he says, it's Damien. And the ceiling falls in and kills him. Now, surely this movie is not a foretaste of the future Antichrist. This is just a Hollywood movie. God isn't in charge of Hollywood movies. The Antichrist wouldn't be growing up killing scores of people and get away with it. Also, who would ever dream that an ancient likeness of the Antichrist could emerge to identify him? Such things just don't happen in real life. <laughs> Let's take one more look at Nero, right over here on the first screen. <laughs> His heavy hooded eyelids, ponderous brow and prominent nose suggests an individual with a rather brazen and emotional nature. He, he looks like a man capable of extreme sensitivity and intuition on the one hand, and unbridled cruelty on the other. His, his large eyes were probably capable of a twinkling mirth, and nothing could hide their true coldness. His pouting lips exhibited an extreme and petulant arrogance. They also seemed to characterize something of an effeminate nature. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there could be a fervency there. Those lips pressed together in a victorious smile could charm an audience with enthralling cadences. But it was also obvious that whining, screaming tirades could just as easily course from that twisted mouth. And then there's the imposing chin. It brought the jutting jawline to a strong point. That, uh, the set of that jaw completed a picture of a man with whom one would not want to spend much time. It was. It would be impossible to stay out of trouble with him. His was the face of a born dictator. But so much for ancient things. Let's forget about that. Let's come to the future, to this wonderful election we had in November. Bill Clinton was re-elected. It isn't it amazing? After the Republican landslide two years ago, it seemed impossible that President Bill Clinton could be re-elected. For that matter, no other Democratic president since FDR had won a second term. Some political pundits even suggested that, quote, a dog catcher could win against a draft-dodging womanizer, end of quote. Were they ever wrong? Fewer voters turned out for the national election than ever before. Clinton won with only 49% of 49% of the registered voters. That means that he was elected with less than 25% of America's registered voters. Time Magazine, January 4th, 1993, pages 28 and 29, shows Clinton entering the Oval Office. This is a composite picture, but please notice up here in his left hand, a rose. The rose of the Rosicrucians, guardians of the grail. Now, in case you think that's just a spoof, in the same magazine, Slobodan Milosevic on page 45 is shown with a rose in his hand. And he was called in the article, the Butcher of the Balkans and the High Priest of Ethnic Cleansing. Francois Mitterrand died this last year. Before he died, this picture was taken. Francois Mitterrand and his friends hold, lift their roses as a symbol of their faith in socialism, says the article. But of course, <laughs> There is no international conspiracy. Those who believe in a conspiracy for world government are extremists and hate mongers, right? All this was just a coincidence. In the April 20, 1992 issue of Time magazine, Time chose to change their type style using a larger M on the front cover, introducing candidate Bill Clinton. Here is the Time magazine used the week before, on the 13th of April. And this logo had been used for decades. 
They changed the type style to a larger type style, making the M wider at the top. Doesn't it look like horns atop the head of this negative man? Why would they, why would they show Bill Clinton as a negative picture and the headline read, Why Voters Don't Trust Clinton? The following January, 1993, January 4th, made him the man of the year. Look at him. Look at that M in black above his head. <laughs> Do you suppose that's a fluke? Or were the editors of Time trying to tell us something? If you cover up the right half, the light half, he seems to have a dark side. Is he the man of the year or the man of the ages? Newsweek magazine shows him as the man on the white horse. Can Clinton tame Washington? Look at the many-headed dragon here. And so I must ask the question, is Clinton fighting the dragon or is he in cahoots with the dragon? Burke's Peerage, London, October 28, 1996. President Bill Clinton is related to every Scottish monarch and to the current British royal family. He's related to every ancient aristocratic, aristocratic family in Britain today. And so we give him the dubious title, Guardian of the Holy Grail. <laughs> Our book, Guardians of the Grail and the Men Who Plan to Rule the World, documents the history of European royalty who believe they are divine and have a right to rule the world. This is the goal of all their efforts. If you want to read about the roots, you can get that book. If you've got that book, you might want to read it. Bill Clinton's ancestry. Well, Clinton's ancestry can be traced back on his mother's side to King Henry III, who ruled England from 1227 to 1272. He's also related to, to Presidents William Henry Harrison and Benjamin Harrison. He's directly descended from King Robert I of France. So says Burke's Peerage from London. They are a genealogical society who charts the family trees of all European royalty, the family of the Holy Grail. Now, I talked to a man on the telephone who was out at the booksellers convention, Christian booksellers convention in California last June, July, and um, he saw our magazine with the picture of Nero on the front. And so he shared with our staff member there a little bit, Bob Ulrich, about what he knew about Bill Clinton. And he told a strange story. So I called him on the telephone, got a hold of him, and talked to him for some time at length about his story. And he told me, and what I'm about to tell you, cannot be documented. It's not published in any historical accounts. He said that he was a Rothschild, converted to Christ, now a minister. But that he grew up with Bill Clinton and knew him. Here's what he said. He said, as a child, Bill Clinton attended many of the Rothschild family functions as a boy. He said he even wore a skull cap and rabbis kissed his hand. There came a day when he was designated, when little boy Clinton was designated as the Segula Yelid Eklatosh, the royal boy chosen in a ceremony. And I was told by this descendant of Mayor Amschel Bauer Rothschild that Bill Clinton was due to inherit the family fortune. A Rothschild source said he's heir to the Bank of England Edmund D. Rothschild plans to leave him the family fortune. He also told me that um, Captain William Bly, born in 1754, died in 1817, was the um, great, great, great whatever of William Bly III, father of Bill Clinton, who was killed, by the way, in a car accident three months before Clinton's birth, and that this man, Captain Bly, 
was a member of the Bower Rothschild family lineage. Sailed around the world with Captain James Cook. That's not Kirk, but Cook. From 1772 to 1775. And you remember the mutiny on the bounty? Well, after the mutiny, he was cast adrift in a small boat with 18 of his crew members. In 1789, they drifted 3,600 miles in the South Pacific and survived. In 1806, Captain Bly became the British colonial governor of New South Wales, Australia. Progenitor of William <coughs> Blythe. The Jefferson comes from Thomas Jefferson. According to the story of this man, who claimed to be the grandson of Edmund de Rothschild, Mayor Amschel Bauer Rothschild lived in this house. According to him, in 1772, Mayor Amschel Bauer, who changed his name to Rothschild because of the red shield on the front door of his business, Rothschild means red shield in German, had a heavenly visitation. An angelic creature visited him and told Mayor Amschel Bauer that Jesus was not the Messiah, but that the family from which he descended would produce the Messiah near the end of the 20th century. And so the Rothschilds have been looking for this Messiah ever since. Mayor Amschel Rothschild, born in 1744, died in 1812, had five sons, legitimate sons. He sent them to five European cities to establish banks. Amschel stayed in Frankfurt. Solomon went to Vienna, Nathan to London, Carl to Naples, James to Paris. And Rothschild's, one of Rothschild's brothers, I think there were nine or so, or nine or ten in the family, one of Rothschild's brothers named Marcus came to America and took the name Rockefeller. Now, Heim Schaus writes, this is 1938 when Heim Schaus first publishes his work, The Jewish Festivals. In chapter 11, the chapter on the fast of Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, you know, the, the, the dark time. On page 103, on the ninth of Av, the children in the yeshivas, the Hebrew schools, are taught certain stories. They're, they're told about the wicked Nebuchadnezzar who destroyed the temple, and they're told about the wicked Titus who destroyed the other temple, and they, they're told about the wonderful Nero, who was a fine and gentle individual who abandoned his army near Jerusalem, escaped and became a convert to Judaism. Not only that, they say, but the great teacher, Rabbi Meir, was a descendant of his. You mean Rothschild, uh, excuse me, uh, Nero uh, only faked his death? converted to Judaism and produced the 13th century's greatest rabbi, Rabbi Mayer of Rothenburg, Germany. So I called my friend who was the, who, and by the way, his name must remain anonymous, you understand, claims to be a descendant of the Rothschild family dynasty. And he, I asked him, I said, who is Rabbi Mayer? He said, I'm not sure I'll check it out. You see, he has access to, th access to things that are not published. He has access to the true history of the Rothschild family tree. And so he called me back in a few days and said, Rabbi Mayer of Germany, who died in 1293, victim of the German persecution of moneylenders, is the greatest rabbi of the 13th century. He was called the Light of the Exile. His son Amschel Mayer, also spelled M-E-Y-E-R or M-A-Y-E-R or M-A-Y-O-R, disappeared at age 17 and reappeared at age 30 as a very wealthy moneylender. Now, Amschel Mayer had two sons, one named Amschel, another named Edmund, and these names sort of floated down through the family history. In 1594, an Amschel Mayer, offspring of Rabbi Mayer, the light of the exile, changed or took on the name of Bauer. So, it's very possible we have a descendant of Nero who controls the international banking cartel and all the central banks of all the countries in the world. Now, a magazine came out this month in January called Vanity Fair. And in this magazine, Vanity Fair, is um, a story on the Rothschilds, and especially the, 
mysterious death of Amschel last July the 8th in Paris. And I read here, with the mysterious suicide of Amschel Rothschild in his marble bathroom at Paris' Bristol Hotel last summer, uh, Europe's most prominent family lost the best hope of a new generation. Surveying the remaining Rothschild powers from the flamboyant Jacob to the playboy Ely to the remote Evelyn, Sadie Bedell Smith discovers a dynasty in search of a leader. Now, I want to read you how Amschel died. Hanging himself could not have been easy for a man six feet one. The top of the towel rail was only five feet from the floor. <laughs> Although it was possible to kneel on the marble surface enclosing the bathtub and then drop nearly two feet to the floor. Did Amschel commit suicide? Or was somebody trying to get rid of the competition? For Amschel was due to inherit the Rothschild power. William Jefferson Clinton's name in Hebrew adds up to 666. William, with the Vav, Aleph, Yod, Lamet, Yod, Mem, for a total of 97. Jefferson, with the Yod, Pe, Resh, Samik, Nun, for a total of 400. And Clinton, Kaf, Lamed, uh, Yod, Nun, Tet, Nun, a total of 169, a grand total of 666. <laughs> uh, that's in Hebrew, Gematria. Now, the interesting thing about all of this is Hillary's name also adds up to 666 in Hebrew. <laughs> With a chet, a lamid, a resh, a yod, and for Hillary, a total of 248, and Radam, a resh, Dalit, hey, mem, for a total of 249, and Clinton, kaf, lamid, yod, noon, uh, tet, uh, noon, for a total of 169, grand total of 666. At least 56 people have died tragically who knew Clinton quite well. There was Luther Jerry Parks, compiling a major study on Clinton's sexual exploits. The coroner pulled nine bullets from his body. Uh, number two, Joe Parnell Walker, a senior investigator in Clinton's case for the, uh, in the RTC's Washington office. He fell off a balcony of a high-rise apartment building. Then there was Danny Ferguson, Arkansas patrolman who brought Paula Jones to Bill Clinton's room. His wife, Kathy, committed suicide, shot behind her left ear. Two months later, Bill Shelton also committed suicide on her grave, shot behind his ear. There was Vince Foster, Clinton's uh, counsel for Whitewater, who killed himself in Marcy Park. And victims five and six was C. Victor Razor II, a former finance and co-chairman of Clinton's campaign, and his son Montgomery. They were killed in an airplane crash near Anchorage, Alaska, in good weather, of course. <laughs> there was Herschel Friday, another member of Razor's committee. His plane exploded on his, its approach to his own private airstrip in Arkansas. And two days later, Dr. Donald Rogers, uh, his plane crashed on his way to reveal some dirt on Clinton. And then there was Barry Seal, a uh, pilot and drug runner, runner for Clinton out of the uh, Contra affair, you know, and, and the Columbia drug running. Then there were a couple of young teenagers, uh, Kevin Ives and Don Henry, who fell asleep on a railroad track near the Mena Airport. And the next six people came forward claiming to have some special knowledge about the deaths of the boys on the railroad track near Mena. And all were slain before the testimonies could do any good. Victim number 12, Keith Coney, slashed in the neck while fleeing for his life. His motorcycle slammed to the back end of a truck. There was Gregory Collins found shot in the face by a shotgun. There was Keith McCaskill stabbed 113 times. He, he knew he was doomed and had told his family goodbye. There was Jeff Rhodes found in the city dump, shot in the head. His hands, his feet, his head were partly cut off. There was Richard Winters, killed with a 12-gauge shotgun. Jordan Kettleson died of a shotgun blast to the head. And then there was Danny Casalaro, a reporter who was investigating the connections between Whitewater, MENA, BCCI, Iran-Contra, and ADFA. He called this network the Octopus. He was found with his wrist slit in a bathtub of a hotel room in West Virginia. There was Paul Welcher, a Washington, D.C. lawyer investigating MENA. He was found dead in his apartment. There was Ed Wiley, the manager of Clinton's presidential campaign finance committee who carried uh, briefcases full of cash. He reportedly shot himself. There was John A. Wilson, a Washington, D.C. city councilman who was preparing to come forward and talk about Clinton's dirty tricks. He decided to hang himself instead. 
And then there were the 34 innocent businessmen who were killed in a plane crash in Bosnia with Ron Brown. According to Brown's confidants, his fatal mistake was telling Clinton that he was not going to take the rap. He wasn't going to let his wife and son take the rap either. He was going to finger Bill and Hillary instead, and that would have sunk the re-election campaign on the spot. But don't forget Waco. Now, these people were crazy. They studied prophecy. Bill Clinton has been to Israel three times in the last four years. The last time he went, the crowds in Israel shouted, Clinton, Clinton, ruler of the universe. Peacemaker, there he's confirming a covenant between Rabin and Arafat. He made them shake hands. And here he confirms the covenant between Israel and Jordan. And he even goes to Syria to see Hafez Assad because that's the one sticking point that remains in his plans for a new world order. Bill Clinton will be giving his state of address tonight. A few days ago, he was inaugurated for the second term. He placed his hand on the Bible. On this scripture in Isaiah 58, 12. And they that shall be of the family dynasty shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Family dynasty. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. It's going to get Ishmael and Isaac back together again. Jacob and Esau, it's going to be okay. He's going to be called the restorer of paths to dwell in. And he took that verse for himself. That's my verse. As he laid his hand on the Bible, that's me the Bible's talking about. But I'm here to tell you that 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 verse in Isaiah 58 is talking about the Messiah. Now, I ask you to forget what you have seen. <laughs> Lest you too tickle the tail of the dragon. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Help us, protect us by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us sit at thy feet and learn of thee. O Lord Jesus, come quickly. Even so, come. We pray in the name of the lovely one who's coming someday with a shout and the trumpet sound. Dear Lord, we did not want to deliver such a message as this. But we must be faithful to our calling, for someday we hope to hear you say, Well done. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For a free complimentary copy of the magazine, call our offices directly at 1-405-634-1234 or write to Prophecy in the News, P.O. Box 7000, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73153.